The Sega Dreamcast was a sixth generation video game console with a huge arcade library, tons of accessories, and built-in online support right out of the box in 1999. Unfortunately, the Dreamcast was the last Sega console to ever release, ending Sega's 18 years in the console world. But why did it last only two and a half years on the market? Why did such a brilliant, creative console fizzle out so quickly? This is the rise and fall of the Dreamcast. Better graphics means it's more realistic. Sega's new Dreamcast video game console is graphically better. The first home unit able to handle 128 computer bits of data at once. It's sort of a leap in, in video game technology, and Sega's going to use this to make a comeback into the marketplace. When you watch a football game, it looks like you're watching a real game on TV. Dreamcast comes with a built-in modem, making it the first set built for online gaming. It will be bigger than the movie receipts of the box office. A taste of the future. It looks to me like we're cruising towards a seven, seven and a half billion dollar business. He used to be a big PlayStation fan. Oh, technology. But now it lays to rest as his attention's on the Dreamcast. Uh, I've had the Dreamcast quite a few months now, and when my mates come around, they're like, wow, those graphics are rad. It's thinking. Is it going to be real war between Sony and Sega to see who's going to win? We have big confidence that uh, we can win. Yeah! Who's going to fail? <laughs> <laughs> We will survive. The Dreamcast released on November 27th, 1998 in Japan. But it's important to contextualize the Sega Dreamcast by first talking about the console that came before it, the Sega Saturn, which released in 1994. Although the Sega Saturn was touted as powerful at the time, and the game library is generally praised today with cult classics such as Knights into Dreams and Panzer Dragoon, at the time, it was sort of a mess. The console was very pricey to produce at first, meaning Sega was basically losing money producing them to compete with the Sony PlayStation's lower price point. Bernie Stolar, the then president of Sega, abandoned the console completely, saying, Saturn is not our future, after only two years of it being released in the West. He then moved to Jupiter. No, unfortunately he stayed on Earth. But the preemptive strike essentially killed the Saturn, and games were sparse for a couple years. Sega was running out of steam. That's why they needed something new, a console to represent the next stage of technology. Bernie Stolar and the company would push their efforts towards a newer, more futuristic game console. One that they actually believed in, the Sega Dreamcast. Dreamcast symbol mark. それは宇宙の広がりと人間の無限のエネルギーをイメージしたものなんだ。みんなもう知ってると思うけど、気になる性能は、CPU、グラフィック、サウンド、OS と世界でもトップクラスのメーカーと業務提携することによって。the Dreamcast would aim to solve a lot of the issues the company felt they had with the Sega Saturn years prior. For starters, the actual hardware of the console would be a bit cheaper to produce for the company than the Saturn was. You know, so it could like, actually make money or whatever. The company took huge losses on the Saturn, including a 75% drop in profits in the year before the launch of the Dreamcast in Japan. Despite these shortcomings, the Dreamcast drew in a ton of hype. People were skeptical, but it also felt like the future. Pre-orders were skyrocketing. On launch day, with the console set at a price of 29,000 yen, which is roughly $290 in USD, it completely sold out by the end of the day. However, there were only four launch titles in Japan, and the big kahuna, Sonic Adventure, a huge new 3D mainline Sonic game, wasn't to come out until weeks after launch. The four launch titles in Japan were July, Godzilla Generations, Pen Pen Trisalon, and Virtua Fighter 3TB. July was a visual novel, Godzilla Generations is about what you would expect, and Pen Pen Trisalon is, uh, let's just say this game isn't very fun. I actually picked this up when I was getting really into the Dreamcast a couple years back, and I'd, uh, I'd rather just watch paint dry. Virtua Fighter 3 TB was a huge game in Japan, though. In fact, it was the most successful arcade game Sega ever released in Japan. But this lineup wasn't as hype as it maybe could have been. With the Sonic game coming out weeks after launch, the Dreamcast ended up falling short of its goals. The company expected to sell over a million units by February of 
of 99, but it sold less than 900,000 at that time. There were even reports of people trading in their Dreamcasts early on in Japan just to get a PlayStation instead. To compete with the PlayStation and to try to garner more of a market share, Sega reduced the price of the console by about $100 before the launch in North America, making it so the hardware was again unprofitable like the Saturn was. They hoped that this would lead to a huge gain in software purchases, which garner huge profits, obviously. You're just slapping a file on a disc and then selling it for $50. Can't go wrong with that. People even do it on the streets of New York. You ever been encountered by a guy who's like, hey, buy my rap album, and he just won't let you leave? This new price alongside a new game, Soul Calibur, did help Sega regain a huge percent of shares. 17%, in fact. But it wasn't all up and up. EA, you know, the company that makes a dog shit Madden game every year that people still buy for some reason, would then announce they didn't even want to make games for the Dreamcast anymore. Developers didn't want to work on the system because it was all weird and janky. This was a huge hit at the time though because EA was the largest third-party video game publisher. This meant that Madden wasn't coming to the Dreamcast, but they would be able to release their own NFL games through 2K games, which Bernie Stolar, that old hunk of meat I was talking about earlier, thought were better games anyway. Regardless of this rocky start, the Dreamcast was ready to launch in North America. Sonic will have to run pretty fast to catch Nintendo and Sony, but Sega's off to a good start there, having already pre-sold 300,000 of the Dreamcast console. Hi, Randy. Well, hello. It's thinking. Sega Dreamcast. It's thinking. Sega Dreamcast. These It's Thinking advertisements were part of a general ploy to market the Dreamcast as this futuristic machine. I don't know what it was going for, really. I guess the Dreamcast was just a robot you would put in your living room. It's a supercomputer with a brain. I mean, how else is it going to run Jeremy McGrath Supercross 2000? This thing must be smart. America's branding of the Dreamcast as a human-like Cortana robot, in addition to a much bigger selection of launch titles, was more promising than Japan's release of the console, though. Things were really looking up for once. Sonic Adventure would actually launch on day one. The price was only $199. They fired this old fuck. Remember him? It was great! The Dreamcast would launch in North America on September 9th, 1999 at $199, which was great for marketing campaigns. You couldn't mess it up. $9999 for $99. Wait, no. $9999 for $199. Okay, I messed it up. But regardless, it was great for commercials. Sega set a new sales record by selling over 225,000 consoles in just 24 hours, earning the company nearly $100 million in sales on the first day. Within two weeks, they sold over 500,000, and Sega held 31% of North American market share by Christmas of that year. Games like Sonic Adventure, Soul Calibur, an incredibly beautiful fighting game at the time graphics-wise, and Sportsball Fans Dream, NFL 2K, made for a pretty successful couple of months. In Europe, the console released on October 14th of that year, and it did okay, and it also got sold in Australia and New Zealand, but like, who cares? The point is that the Dreamcast was cool. Nerds could play Sonic, and frat guys could stare at Soul Calibur booby and drink beer to NFL game. The problem, though, is that even though the Dreamcast was doing pretty well at first, it couldn't outcompete Sony's giant behemoth, the PlayStation. その日、セガエンタープライズ専務ゆかを秀和は驚くべき街の声を耳にした。セガなんてだってよな。プレスの方が面白いよな。そうなのか。なんてこった。止めてくれ。一人になりたいんだ。くそ。ええ。セガなん
Maybe he's not bald, but he's ugly. By the time these things released in 2000 and 2001, the Dreamcast just couldn't compete. And I love the PS2 and the GameCube. I mean, I have a ton of games right here, but I just hold a soft spot in my heart for the Dreamcast. It's such a weird, quirky console, and it had a lot of cool games. So I want to show you some of them. Shh. It's thinking. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus, fuck, it's thinking. It's thinking. Oh, Jesus. It's gonna take over the world. Think about this, you son of a bitch. Yeah, I didn't predict that one, huh? The future. Nowadays, if you try to boot up a Dreamcast, you have to put in the date every single time. It is 100% November 27th, 1998. Thank you, Dreamcast. This thing had cool features, like you could play music. I could slap in my Kids Bop CD and have a great time. Never gets old. I modded my Dreamcast, which is totally not illegal, and I'm not going to jail. It just came like this, I swear. Pretty cool, right? This is Super Magnetic Neo, a platformer game that came out in the year 2000. It's super fun, actually, although I'm absolutely terrible at it. I think it's Sega's answer to the Crash Bandicoot games, which were really popular at the time. And it does a pretty decent job at giving Crash a run for his money. As you can see here, there's a bunch of little things that pop up on the Dreamcast memory card. When you insert these into these wacky little spacey controllers, they often have little representations of the game, or sometimes even little mini-games that you can play. They even have a little, like, control pad on, like there's buttons and shit. They wanted to make it so you could actually play on these, like, on the go, like, while you're going to school, connect with your friend. Shit was crazy. Seaman. This legendary creature... <laughs> he said Seaman. It's voiced by the fucking Star Trek guy. Kid. The st Leonard Nimoy, the, the Star Trek guy, voiced this game. It's body time, let's have some fun. Woo! Hang on. This is one of my favorite Dreamcast games. It's a really good arcade title. And what was really cool about the Dreamcast is it had a bunch of arcade titles. You could play those arcade fighting games. There are accessories like fight sticks that would allow you to play these epic, large-scale kind of Japanese fighting games. The Dreamcast was a great console for these weird arcade ports. The Dreamcast had this really awesome fighting game called Power Stone, which had a sequel as well. You could play with up to four players and actually interact with the environments while you're fighting. These games fetch insane prices on eBay right now, but I really recommend playing them if you can. Much like Smash Brothers Melee, was for the Nintendo GameCube, this is the Dreamcast's best multiplayer fighting game. Without even getting into the endless library of amazing 2D fighters, the console also had a ton of really cool and zany RPGs, some of them exclusive to the Dreamcast at the time, like Time Stalkers, Fantasy Star Online, Shenmue, Skies of Arcadia, and Elemental Gimmick Gear. Elemental Gimmick Gear, or Egg, has a really unique style. Caught myself playing it for a bit recently, actually. 3D platformers are on the system, like Super Magnetic Neo and Sonic Adventure, lots of cool horror games games like D2 and Ill Bleed, rhythm games like Space Channel 5, Andrew Callahan from the future. There's a Berserk game, you weebs. They even made a Sonic clone of Mario Party. Okay, actually, don't play that one. It's not that good, but it's interesting, I guess. My favorite game for the Dreamcast, though, is probably Choo Choo Rocket. It's a really simple game, but it's a multiplayer puzzle game which will keep your brain on its toes. It's a lot of fun, and you can actually still pick it up physically for super cheap last time I checked. The Dreamcast just has this ever-expanding library of interesting software, despite only being around for a few short years. It's amazing how overlooked this console was. It had online play in 1999. You could hook up your keyboard and send chat messages to other gamers in the 90s. The specs of this console were outstanding. It ran pretty good, looked great, and played great. Some of the games have been ported over the years, but there's still a ton of hidden gems sitting, locked away on the console after all this time. Yeah, it couldn't beat the PS2. Heck, it couldn't even beat the older beat-up PS1. But it's still an amazing console that deserves some attention. If if you're able to, I highly recommend picking one up. And if you wait too long, don't forget, it's fucking thinking. Like, it'll find you. <laughs> if you don't buy it, it will program a way for itself to buy you. Anyway, peace.